Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another TechSoup Connect Australia presentation. And I am so excited. You're going to love what we've got going on today. We're doing MarTech, which is marketing technology with um, amazing marketer guru, Rachel Collard. She is the founder of SMB Marketing Solutions, which is a company that provides powerful marketing solutions specifically for entrepreneurs. And this is definitely going to be transferable and applicable to your nonprofit if you're here with a nonprofit agency. She has she is an MB, MBA qualified and certified practicing marketer. And Raquel shows purpose, sorry, Rachel, ah, I do that every time. Rachel shows purpose-led entrepreneurs and small business owners how to leverage the potential of, of a strategic marketing roadmap that is customized to their unique organizational and business needs. Her new book, Marketing Launchpad, is going to be released this month, March of 2023. And personally, I cannot wait to read it. I, I was so blessed to get to see an advanced copy of it. And I tell you, if you want to know about marketing, especially as a small business owner or small not-for-profit, you are going to want to get your hands on a copy of this. So without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to turn you over to Rachel Collard. Thank you very much for that, Kat. And that's very generous. I appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and hope that this works. And where did it go? Hold on a second. Can you see that? I'm seeing you started screen sharing, but it, oh, there it is. There it is there. Okay, yep, cool. There you go. So let me just maximize that. Perfect. Okay, so you've got the slides. Excellent. Yep. All right. So today, as Kat said, we're going to cover off MarTech for Impact. Um, super fast intro to me, um, which I don't need to do anymore because we've already covered all of this. Um, but my book, Marketing Launchpad, as Kat said, is available. Um, it's launching on the 20th of March. Um, it is on pre-order at the moment on Amazon and all the other online channels. So, and it will be ebook, paperback, and audiobook. And I'm super excited and completely stressed and losing my mind, but you know, it's fine. So um, now let me see. So marketing technology, it's one of those things that is completely stressful and overwhelming for a lot of people. And the reason for that is illustrated by these diagrams here. So every year I used to get a one-page summary from um, the State of MarTech report that gave me an overview of how much technology choices, how many technology choices there were out there. And in 2011, there was less than 150. It could fit on one page. They could show the complete logos and it was, you know, a really good reference point. It's grown so rapidly since then. So it's over 5,000% growth um, until 2020. And if you have a look at it in 2022, which is the most recent version of this report, the logos have become fav icons and you can barely read it on this spreadsheet. It's now a um, an A3, not an A4. And there's nearly 10,000 choices um, in marketing technology solutions for you to choose from. So there's no wonder that it is absolutely overwhelming for people. But I'm here to help you out. So stay calm. All you need to do is a little bit of focus and a little bit of process and methodology, and we can totally make it work for you. So today we're going to cover off using the right technology and tools, but that meet your needs. So everyone's business is structured differently. Everyone's got different capabilities. Everyone's got different needs. Um, and then we'll look at the way that all of these systems that you use can integrate with each other. Um, we'll look at how you can create some workflows that might take some of the admin and the um, manual work out of your day-to-day -day delivery. And then I'll also touch on some key email marketing automations um, that are really critical for anyone in business. And obviously those are important to me because I'm a marketer and I like email marketing because you can totally control it. So the secret to marketing technology and getting it to work for you is making it as easy as possible for you to get your marketing done. Now that also applies to your other business systems and they all will integrate with your marketing systems. But what I find is if you take the time to set it up well, and if you take the time to plan out all of your processes, 
it's ma- it makes it a lot less stressful for you to deliver day to day. And it means that if you're set up well, you can scale and you don't actually have a lot of additional work as you get busier and busier and busier. And that means that you can actually focus on delivering your products and making the impact that you do want to have in the world. So it is critical um, that you do make it as easy as possible for yourself. And the other thing with uh, marketing technology, and I say this with a couple of caveats. So obviously when you're first starting out, you might not be able to build out the entire system that you're going to have um, as you bring in more clients, but you do need to have a plan in place to get you from point A to point B. And if you can, start as you mean to go on. So by that, I mean, if you need certain functionality in say your email marketing system, they usually have different plans that you can move up through as you get busier and busier. So you can start with a free or a really cheap plan and then move your way up. But pick the technology solution that actually meets the needs you've got. And I'll give you some tips on how to go about that in a little while. But with all marketing technology, the heart of it is actually your website. And um, And then everything kind of bolts on around it. So this is a screenshot of a very basic marketing technology system. And it's going to depend on what you need to deliver as to what plugs in where. But ultimately, the heart will be your website. And then you'll work out how to integrate it with the other systems that you do need. And these are just some of them. So on the marketing side, you've got your marketing, your email marketing system. It might do SMSs. You've got review systems and social media management tools and your listings management. Um, All the systems need to be integrated with your reporting and analytics. And then on your operations side, you've often got a CRM, project management tools, your calendar tools and your accounting and your invoicing. But the way you structure it is going to depend on what your actual requirements are. And the way you structure it also depends a lot on what is on offer from the platforms you do choose. So what I recommend is if you start by selecting the right web platform for you, then you can work out what is actually going to work best with that platform. And usually website systems and all systems um, in technology have native integrations where they've got an easy turn on, turn off kind of tool that'll integrate your two systems. Then you go into the more advanced custom integrations or APIs. Um, So most technology is built on a very similar platform. In most cases, it's an SQL database and you can integrate it if you can do some data mapping with your APIs. Custom integrations are usually more time and labor intensive. Um, They are oftentimes more expensive and they do break occasionally. Native integrations will still break, but probably not to the same degree. Um, And then if you've got two systems that don't seem to relate, then things like Zaps and um, all the equivalents. So Zapier um, does, it allows you to mesh two systems together to make it um, easy for them to talk to each other. Again, Zaps do break occasionally, but they're a really good um, interim tool, particularly if you've got two systems that you're absolutely dedicated to using. So... Um, the thing about websites, it's an interesting one. So as I said earlier, it is going to be the core of all of your marketing technology. But the honest fact is 59% of small businesses in Australia don't have a website. Um, But 90% of people are using the internet to find local businesses. So if I can just say, if you don't have one, please get one. Um, It's incredibly important. It's quite a gamble not to have one. And even Even the corner store these days, if you don't have a website, you don't exist for Google, which means if somebody's searching on a map um, to find a local corner store and you don't have an online presence, you won't be recognisable. Therefore, you won't show up in a search and then you're missing out on all of that traffic. So I think it's really important, regardless of what your business is, to make sure that you do have a website. So when you're planning out your technology, as I said, we start with the website itself. So you choose a platform that delivers everything you need. Now, obviously that changes according to what your business type is. And also you've got some different choices about how you get that delivered. So there's a lot of all-in-one platforms. So if you're a coach or a course provider, you've probably heard of Kajabi. It does a lot of things for you. Um, But it's a subscription-based model. Um, And then you've got other subscription type uh, sites 
platforms like Wix or um, Squarespace, they all have different capabilities and different plugins that you can bring in. Then if you want something completely independent, you've got things like WordPress where you just pay for your hosting and your website is transportable. But the core of WordPress is very um, finite. And then you can add in plugins or add-ons to it, um, which can occasionally lead to issues between the integrations between those. But it, you've got to make sure that you are making the right decision for you and your business. So if you're in e-commerce, you might need to offer different currencies. You might need to offer different sales tax um, regions, which means that is actually going to discount half the options you've got out there. Um, if you've got a large catalogue or you need to be able to offer multiple shop fronts, that's again going to limit your choices. So if you can actually put down the criteria that you've got and you look at the products you do want to deliver, then that's actually going to help you make a really good decision about the right platform for you. Then we look at how the rest of your technology infrastructure system works. So then once you've got that choice made, then you decide does your web platform give you a CRM, for instance, and does it do everything you want it to do? Does it integrate your calendar scheduling or do you have a native or do you need to add on an integration for that? Does it work with your invoicing or accounting systems? Um, does it have a native email system or do you need to bolt one onto the side? Same for review systems. So this is when you look at everything you've got that you want to deliver and then everything that you need in terms of a system to how to deliver it and make some choices about that will be influenced by what a native integrations are available to you, um, what APIs are available, all of that kind of thing. So you work out the best way of getting them all to work nicely. And then the next step in the process is mapping out all of the processes that you actually do undertake on your website. So you need to make a call about what system does what. Um, a lot of, uh, there's always a lot of crossover. So usually a web platform can do email automation for you, or you might want a separate one, but you've got to make a call about which one's going to do what. Um, you've got to work out if one process in one system, so say a person makes a purchase on your website, what do you need that to trigger in terms of workflows and automations? Do they then need to go to a CRM? Do they need to go to a project management tool? Um, how do they communicate with your accounting system? So you need to map out all of that so you can make sure that you're using the right processes and systems for you. Now, if we look at, I'm going to go through some of the key integrations just so that you can get a clearer idea of how you can break down that massive spider web mess that I showed you earlier. Uh, but just to make sure that everyone's on the same page, um, the CRM system that I was talking about is a customer relationship management system. Um, and this is the definition from Salesforce, but you've got a lot of choices for a CRM um, and you've got to work out um, what your requirements are. So Salesforce is a very popular one, uh, particularly for companies with sales, to, uh, sales teams. Um, you've got things like HubSpot, which is probably one of the more popular ones with marketers because it integrates a lot of marketing systems with it. Um, but there's so many to choose from that you've just got to make sure, again, that you map out the requirements that you do have. So in terms of how you integrate your website with a CRM, um, there's a few key things that you need to um, ask yourself. So does your website have one? And if it does, is it enough for what you need it to do? Or do you need to integrate it to a separate CRM system? Um, if you're doing an integration, which one of those is going to be your source of truth? So and this is really important for data cleanliness and keeping all of your systems clean. And particularly in an era where we've got a lot of privacy concerns, you don't want to be holding data in a lot of different places. You want it to be updatable in one spot so that if somebody unsubscribes that it goes through all of your systems, if you update an address detail that it goes through all of your systems, um, you also need to consider who needs to use it. So is it a sales team? Is it a product delivery team? Is it a customer support team? You need to make sure that all of their requirements are met within the technology that you do select. Um, and then where do you manage your workflows? Like if you're delivering a group coaching program, for instance, does your website do everything you need it to do? 
or do you actually need to trigger off an automated workflow in another system to help you manage all of those um, job requirements? So those are some of the key things that you've got to keep in mind for a CRM integration. And again, the choice of the CRM, if you do need an extra one, is often going to be based on what is natively integrated with the website platform you've chosen. Um, but a, in the case where you've got a CRM that's got the functionality you absolutely need, like for instance, Salesforce does have a customer support app. It's got a tech support app. It's got a sales app. It's got all of these functions that you might need, um, which means that you're going to need to make sure that it can integrate between the two systems. Another key integration is your accounting system. And this is particularly, it gets a little bit complicated when you um, look at selling into different markets. So again, you need to make the call of is it one system and you can run everything out of your website, for instance, or do you need a separate accounting system for your taxes? Do you need um, a separate Payment gateway, in most cases, you do need separate payment gateways to take payments on any website system. Some of them natively integrate, some of them you need to add on. Um, do you need a different checkout module or is the one on your website going to work for you? And do you need to offer multiple currencies or multiple um, sales tax options? So, for instance, I sell books across multiple markets. GST only applies to Australian clients. So, on my website, I need to make sure that I'm capturing address information so that I can then, when they go through the payment gateway, I've got another system attached to that, which is Quaderno, which calculates the applicable sales tax. And then it manages all of my sales tax commitments for me so that I can um, not be in violation of EU sales tax or American sales tax or whatever um, requirements you are. And if you're selling to the US, can I just say that every state runs differently? So you're going to need some help in that space and there's no getting around it. You've got to be registered for it and you've got to make sure that your system can deliver what you need to deliver to them. Um, and that's even with, you know, a, a, we've got ta our tax file numbers can actually um, be used on an international basis, but we've got tax treaties and everything like that, but you still need to be able to manage all of this. And I've got to tell you, it's really bloody hard. So I use Quaderno, even though it costs me money, it does the job for me. Um, and then the other thing is, which of these systems is actually going to be sending the invoice to your clients? Um, they can all do it. Your website can do it. Your payment gateways can do it. Your, um, if you use Quaderno, it can do it. Or you, your accounting system can do it. So, um, so you've got to make a choice and not have them all issuing it or else you're just going to get really embarrassed. Um, Kat, did you have a question there? I do. You've mentioned an accounting system, Coderno. How do you, could you drop that in the chat? Because I don't know how to yeah, spell it. That's okay. Um, I Thank can you. do that right now. Coderno. Yep. I'll send you a link after I've finished as well. Um, but that's the name to look for. Um and the other thing I suppose here is you also don't want to be manually having to enter off the invoices that come out of all of your systems into your accounting system for your tax. So make sure that it can automatically integrate. So I use Xero, a lot of websites like QuickBooks or Xero or um, any of the other options you've got out there. Just make sure that you automate as much of that sending information as you can. Um, and that could be through a zap, it could be through the native integration, um, or I think um, like Quaderno integrates with Zero, so it'll push it straight in there for me. Um, and just streamline all of those. So particularly if you're a solopreneur or you've got a very small team, you don't want to be messing around with manual systems when technology can actually make it easier for you. Okay, next up we go to scheduling and calendars. So this one, particularly for coaches um, or anyone offering a free consultation call, having a public um, and bookable calendar link on your website is actually one of the easiest ways to get people into your funnel, as it were. Um, so if you have a book a call or if they buy coaching sessions with you, but you want to be able to let them schedule it themselves, then a booking calendar option is really um, useful to have. But there's a few things that you need to keep in mind with this one. So, and when I'm talking about a booking calendar, I'm talking about things like Calendly or Acuity Scheduling or any of the other solutions that are out there. 
So you need to make sure that one, you can embed a booking form on your website and that they do feed um, the availability from one system to the other so that it's showing an accurate availability for you. You also need to make sure that it integrates with your real calendar. Um, so if you run your life in Outlook or you run your life in Google Calendar or whatever you do choose, you've got to make sure that when you pop an appointment in there, that it's going to take your availability out of your public calendar and vice versa. So, and a lot of them integrate with multiple calendars. So I've got a personal one, I've got my, I've got different brand emails and that kind of thing. So you can integrate as many as you need to. And it's really important that you do make sure that they do all sync together or you're going to end up looking like an idiot when you double book someone. The other thing is um, the, uh, I am having trouble seeing that one. Right. And the meeting platform that you use. So if you use online meeting tools like Zoom, um, or Google Meet or whatever it is, make sure that they all integrate as well so that if a new booking is made on your calendar, that it automatically creates the link to your meeting and integrates that information. Um, the more you can automate these, the better off you're going to be. And the other thing as well is that if you can make sure that one of your systems is doing your email confirmations about the booking, that it sends the reminders when you want it sent, you're going to have fewer no-shows. So it's always, um, the more you can set up those processes and automate them, the easier your life is. So even with um, people who know me, if they send me an email and say, I want to catch up, when are you available? I'll send them a link to my Calendly account because that way it saves us going backwards and forwards and ripping my hair out because 15 minutes later, it's, it's just too frustrating. Um, and it also means that I know that reminders will be sent, that I won't have to worry about no-shows. If they need to reschedule, they've got a button there that they can press that'll actually allow them to do it. So this is one of those key integrations that will save you so much time, effort, and energy. And it's something that you can also embed in your other processes. So if you show, if you have, say, a package of six coaching sessions that you sell, you can put the booking link into those sessions so that people can book it automatically and you don't have to do the toing and froing with them. So this one's a really good time saver, particularly for coaches and consultants. Um, and I have different appointment types for different products that I offer. So if it's a roadmap discovery call, it looks different than if it's a follow-up call, for instance, that kind of thing. Um, and yep, as Kat says, it makes you look a lot more professional as well. So and images everything in, in marketing. So as in probably in life. The next key one and one that's particularly dear to my heart is email marketing automations. And the reason I say this is a lot of people focus on social media and sharing their content on socials. And I've got 10,000 followers or a million followers, whatever it is, but you don't own those followers and if the social media platform turns you off and that's your primary source of um, business then you are going to be in trouble whereas if you make sure that you build out your subscriber list that is an asset that you own as a business owner you've got a lot more control over it it is a valuable asset and it also allows you to um, build better relationships with your clients or your potential clients so with um, and it's actually got one of the best ROIs in marketing. So it's, some people say it's around the 270% mark. The amount of time and energy you send, spend in setting up a system is going to pay itself back. So some of the key automations that I definitely um, think everybody needs to have in place, a new subscriber journey. So if somebody subscribes to your newsletter, have some intro emails that go out to them before you add them to your newsletter list. So tell them what other helps available, tell them what to expect, direct them, direct them to resources, that kind of thing, but make it more welcoming. Tell them a bit about you. Um, same for new customers. So if somebody buys a product, make sure that you've got a customized onboarding um, email campaign that goes out to them so that you can say thank you and you can welcome them and you can um, tell them what to expect next and what are the first steps they need to take. Those are really critical to a really good customer experience um, and they help reinforce what your website is telling them. So even if you take them straight to 
a product page, for instance, where they've got access to resources, um, you're still reinforcing it and you're giving them links that it's easy to click onto and get to the right place. Um, things for lead magnets, make sure that you've got a planned process for them. So they need to confirm their email address. Then you give them access to the download or the quiz or whatever it is. Um, then you follow up with how did they find it? Was it useful? Then you sell them the next step in their um, in your product range um, or whatever's natural or if it's a book or call, whatever it is. But just make sure that you map all of those out. Um, if you're an e-commerce platform, this is particularly important. If you can, do an abandoned cart journey. It won't trigger for everybody because obviously you need to have captured an email at some point. But if they start on the checkout journey and then they give it up partway through, it's not that invasive for people to actually say, oh, you know, this is your cart, this is your cart, this is what you had in it, click here to complete the purchase. It's also an opportunity for you if you feel like they're not going to convert straight away to give them an offer, that kind of thing. But those kind of journeys are really simple to set up, but they also do pay dividends. And then if your customers are a little bit inactive or your subscribers are inactive and, you know, after 90 days or or whatever um, period that you consider appropriate, have a reactivation one. Um, a lot of times for e-commerce solutions, after three months of inactivity, you might do a we miss you email and here's a, um, here's a coupon code to get 10% or 50 bucks or whatever off your next order. Um, same for subscribers. Just say, just wanted to make sure that you're still out there, um, that you still want to get it. If they don't reactivate on your subscriber list, then put them out into a holding list so that your database stays fresh. Um, that's really important for deliverability and domain authority. Um, so, so if we want to look at an example of one of these, um, this would be a a new customer onboarding journey. So what usually happens is you place, you purchase your product on the website, you inevitably get taken to a thank you page, um, which will either give you a instruction to check your mailbox to verify your email address, or if you're being a little bit lazy, it might give you direct access to the download. However you go with that, I would recommend a double opt-in um, where you can, because with email deliverability, it's actually getting really hard to get into people's inboxes these days. So if you actually use it as a little bit of a bribe that they have to click on a button in an email, which means it'll be recognized as not junk, then um, your life becomes a lot easier and all of these other emails will actually make it through. Um, what will happen after they get to the landing page? Obviously an invoice usually or a receipt gets emailed to them. Then you can start on an email onboarding journey. So an example of email one would be thank you for your purchase. Welcome. Um, here are, this is how you can contact me if you need help at any point. Email two could be the same day. It could be three days later. It depends on your rhythm, um, but it could be next step. So that could be um, the link to the download if it wasn't in the first email um, or, you know, this is what I recommend for you if you're doing a longer course do this questionnaire, read this, and then start your first unit, that kind of thing. After you've delivered your product, or if it's a longer course, you may want to check in after week one or month one. You can check in and see how they're going. Did they find it useful? Ask for feedback and say if they need help, then this is how they can book a call with you or find more information. And then assuming they're happy, um, further on down the track, usually post-purchase and post-completion, um, you request reviews. So, and if you can automate that process, your life does become a lot easier. Um, and you can then give them the next offer in the mix, which is, um, it's going to keep them loyal. It's going to give them the next level of value. It's going to solve another problem for them. So it's good to be really systematic. And if you map all of these out, you'll actually see how everything works together, which is um, very beneficial to you as a business person. But if we look at that same purchase from a behind the scenes um, point of view, it's it looks slightly different. So your client makes the purchase on your website, but then there's usually automations that will give the client access to the product if it's an immediate thing. Usually you want to do something like tag the client so you can segment your database and you can know what kind of products you're providing to them. The invoice that got sent to the client, a copy of that will get automatically sent to your accounting system. 
um, so that it's there in place for when you're ready to do your tax or your best statements. And then a lot of times you want to do, you want the client automatically added to your CRM, even if it's an external one. Um, and then you want to maybe automatically assign an account manager for that person to make sure that all of their needs are met. Um, and then they would, and obviously you need to tell the account manager that they've been assigned and they might want to reach out. Then you can got the opportunity there to create workflows around that particular product. So for instance, if um, like when I'm doing a marketing plan for a client, I send them a discovery email, uh, or sorry, a discovery questionnaire that they go through. Um, and then I've got a checklist of things that I need to have make sure happen so that I deliver the product that they need. So on mine, they need to schedule a, um, a discovery call with me. So that's usually in my first email to them. But I also have a checklist that says, have they scheduled it? What date is it on? Do I have everything I need? Have I received the questionnaire or do I need to chase them before it? That kind of stuff. Then I have things like um, actually doing the work. So whatever is part of that. So for me, it's like a website audit. It's um, an assessment of all of their messaging. I have a checklist that I go through. And then um, and then there's a follow-up session as well, which is all part of that workflow. So I know as I'm moving through it, that I'm getting everything that I need to get done, done, that it's been assigned to the right people and that there's deadlines put on it. So, you know, if I'm doing a marketing plan for somebody, I usually want to deliver it within one or two weeks. So if you can automate all of those and make your life easier, it just means you can focus on the work as opposed to all of the scheduling you need to do or all of the planning you need to do. And then once your product has been delivered, then you put them into a post-purchase campaign. So that could be something that your account manager could do, or it could just be something that your account manager assigns them to, or it could be part of your workflow. So the minute you tick off that you have had the follow-up session with the client, one of your automations in your workflow could be that it automatically adds them to a post-purchase campaign and gives them the next offer. So this is where those efficiencies really come in and it saves you admin time and it saves you a lot of aggravation, but it also means that all of your systems can be replicated. So as you bring new team members in, you can actually build these systems out to assign it to the people who are going to do the particular work involved. Um, and if you build it up um, right from the beginning, then scaling doesn't become a mad scramble and you don't have to be that stressed. It's just you've got to make sure you've got the people to do the work. So that's sort of a workflow um, example of the exact same situation, but the previous slide was what the client sees. This is what you would be doing in the back end. Now, there are some other key tools um, that you do need to look at from your marketing technology point of view. And these are all about saving you time, saving your sanity and making your life a lot easier. So social media scheduling and management tools, a lot of people don't use them, which means if you're on three social media platforms, you've got to log in to three social media platforms every time you want to do a post. And in my world, that's a little nutty. So don't do that. Um, it's also most of them allow you to um, see what comments and what engagement you're getting from people and respond to them on that one tool that you've got there. Um, they all have analytics and metrics capabilities and they... Um, and they all should integrate with um, any of your analytics tools. So, and there's also a bit of, um, with social media, there is a best practice that says you kind of have a different message when you're on Instagram versus when you're on Facebook versus LinkedIn. My theory is if you're being fairly authentic and you're not being too gimmicky, you could probably repurpose the same content across multiple platforms so long as you get your format right. So if you're using Instagram, you know that you need an image um, or a video. If um, And if you, uh, and some of them have limitations on the number of images you can use in one post, that kind of thing. But I'd say get as many efficiencies as you can out of it. And I'm lazy. So when I do my posts, I use a social media scheduling tool, same post, all platforms. Um, because if it works on one and I'm telling the truth about something, then it doesn't matter to me that, I'm not maybe being quirky enough and I don't do TikTok, so I don't have to be, you know, weird over there and sensible over here. Um, but work with what is best for you. The other thing is re um, review automations. So 
if like that journey we showed you before, if you make sure that you put in um, links to where you need your reviews to show up. So you could be using something like Trustpilot or Yotpo if you've got an independent one, or you could just be using your Google business listing or your social pages. Just pick them, work out if you need to rotate through several of them to make sure you get a good balance um, and automate it again as much as you can. If you don't do it in an email campaign, some of these review automation systems can send you an SMS if that's appropriate for your product. So just make sure that it is in your system somewhere that you are automatically asking for reviews and feedback. Um, listings. Most people don't know what listings are, um, but they are one of the most undervalued and maligned um, marketing tools out there. So there is software that allows you to sync your listings between multiple platforms. So it's the equivalent of the online telephone books, basically. But what it does do is it can help drive traffic to your website. It does create backlinks, um, which can help you build domain authority. It's very good for SEO. So, but you don't want to have to go out to 47 different platforms and make sure and put all of your information there each time. What you want to do is put it into one spot and then have that tool um, sync it out to all of those platforms wherever possible. So worth doing. Um, it's something that I review each quarter, make sure that I've got as much information as I can. Um, if you're very good, you'd have a system that um, updates it instantaneously. Um, I've got a tool on my site that I use, um, which if you ask for a digital marketing audit, you'll get a free trial of, um, but I can give you more information about that later on. The other thing is analytics and reporting. Um, anything you do in marketing and anything you do in business needs to be measured. So if you've got analytics tools, like you can use Google analytics, your website platform will have analytics. Um, make sure it's giving you the reports that you do need that gives you valu valuable information. So a lot of analytics, particularly around social, are quite, they're called vanity metrics. So even if you've got 10,000 followers on Instagram, if none of them are buying, they're not really of much value to you. So if you've got a good analytics tool that can tell you that from Instagram, you're getting this many inquiries and it's generating this much income, then you know it's worth doing. But if you say, I've only got 20 followers on LinkedIn, but they're delivering 10 grand in um, revenue, then I'd be spending more time on LinkedIn than I would be on Instagram. So it allows you to make some really good um, calls on where to spend your time and energy. And then, of course, everybody's talking about chat GPT and AI at the moment. So can I just say they're really fun to play with, but don't get don't fall down the rabbit hole unless you've got a really good reason to do it. So I use AI tools. Um, AI is embedded into a lot of things. AI is embedded into search results on Google. It's embedded into um, where your ads are placed um, on paid advertising. Um, and it the trick is work out what you need to achieve, then find the right tool for it. So if you're struggling with coming up with content ideas, then there are a lot of content generating tools out there. Um, and some of them can even help you write it, but you still will need to edit it for your tone of voice and what you want to say. Um, you know, people tell me that they can write books in um, AI tools and I've seen people do it, but it's not my style of writing. So um, it depends on how passionate I guess you are or how particularly you are about what, what kind of content you're putting out there. AI is really good at consolidating information, giving you ideas, giving you direction. But if you want to personalize it and make it yours, you're going to use it as an idea generator, but then you're going to write the content yourself. Um, and you also don't want to be one of the same. So if you have a very distinct tone of voice, if you have a very distinct approach to business, then um, AI is going to get you so far. Um, that said, they've got some really cool image generating tools. They've got amazing things that can be helpful. You've got AI tools that can help you put captions on your videos, that kind of thing. So use what's appropriate to your overall strategy. Um, Tassie's asked, do I have any good suggestions for analytics tools that will help with social metrics? It depends on what kind of metrics you want to get. So if you want to see what kind of traffic and revenue um, is getting driven to and from your website, then Google Analytics is your easy one. 
Um, but if you want to get into more of the demographics kind of thing, then you might have to actually look at each of the individual social platforms metrics. Um, but you are still going to get a consolidation of, um, say, demographics from all website visitors on Google Analytics. So there are so many choices on that one that it really comes down to what you do need to do. And I honestly get most of the analytics that I need out of Google and it's free. So why wouldn't I use it? And I just create my own reports. So that's that one. Um, okay. So, so the question really becomes is what does your technology marketing technology landscape look like? Is it complicated? Is it complicated like this? Or can you take some of these out and push them into one central system? Is that the appropriate solution for you? That's going to come down to looking at your systems and processes and working out exactly what you're trying to get out of it. So, and just make sure that where you can be conscious of the fact that you've got native integrations in some systems, um, but you might have to build out integrations with others, but keep it as easy as possible. Now, one of the things I do for clients um, is a MarTech check. Um, and basically it's a three-step process where we have a look at what technology you're using or that you want to use. We have a look at where you want to get to. And it's pretty much like any planning process. I do a very similar method for when I'm doing marketing planning with people. Um, we do a gap analysis and then I can help you with some recommendations. Um, obviously with 10,000 choices out there, I'm not going to be able to recommend every single one of those because I don't know them all. But I do have enough exposure to probably more systems than most business users um, business people get because I'm um, working with people who use multiple platforms. So what I usually do here is like a good, better, best solution. Um, it'll come down to budget. It'll come down to options. It'll come down to different functionality, but, um, but this is an option for you. Other people can obviously help you do this kind of thing. There's online um, checklists that you can download. If you want to try it yourself, I never really found one that fitted me perfectly so I kind of came up with my own which is why um, this product exists because I did this for myself as well so that's probably a really quick overview of marketing technology and how you can use it to help if you do want to talk about it more from a marketing point of view um, absolutely happy to jump on a call with you that's the booking link um, if you did want to actually explore that MarTech check, um, I have set up a landing page um, at the address there, which is smbmarketing.com.au forward slash TechSoup. And there is a discount code on there um, for any of those products. So I really do encourage you to get your marketing technology to work for you so that you can then go out and make that impact that you need to make in your business and in the world, because your time's better spent delivering what well, only you can deliver. And if you can streamline a lot of your processes, then your life is actually going to be a lot more enjoyable and a lot simpler. So does anyone have any questions? Or have we covered them all? Because we, as we were doing it as we went through. Did you uh, mention any suggestions for doing that syncing up of your information? Uh, for the listings? Yeah. So I've got on my website, I've got um, what I call a marketing toolkit, which does a range of things like social media scheduling, as well as listing synchronization. It can do your reviews and all of that kind of thing. If you on my front and my homepage, there's a request a digital marketing um, report, which is an audit which will see how you're looking on all of those factors. And it also gives you a 14 day free trial of that software. Okay, so cool. that's totally available on the homepage. It's one of the top two buttons. Okay, just dropped your link to your website in the chat. So if anybody wants Thank to check you. that out, cool. you can do that. And any other questions, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask. And I will stop sharing as well. So. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, well then I'm gonna wrap up this part of it. And then if we wanna stick around for a few minutes, we've still got about 15 minutes before we have to jump off. So I'm going to thank everyone for coming and your kind attention today. And if you're joining us on the replay, I hope you are getting as much out of it as we got today, because this has been absolutely brilliant. Um, like I said, Rachel absolutely knows her stuff. She's got her book coming out. Um, marketing launch pad coming up what is that actually launching this month the 20th of march so oh. yes it's so soon so I'm be one of the cool out. kids and get your and pre reserve your copy now <laughs> <laughs> it's on amazon all amazons so all good and like i said i was blessed to see a preview copy of it and it is just next level I mean, totally, totally next level. And so we would just want to thank uh, Rachel for coming and sharing her time and expertise today. It has been a marvelous, informative, very value-packed workshop. And thank you so much for that. Thank you. And our next workshop, I'm dropping the link in the chat so you can go ahead and register for that, is going to be on the 15th of March with Andrea Westbrook. And it's all about why your organization needs to be size inclusive. So it's one of those more culture type of things, but it's one of those that a lot of people don't think about that there's still a lot of size bias. So it should be a very interesting workshop and I hope that you'll join us then. So until then, I'm Kat Milner, uh, the founder of Create Your Change. It's been my pleasure to be your host today and we'll see you next time.